welcome to Assembly Calendar. I'm Mike Friesan. With us for our program today, Assemblyman Jim Tedisco. Jim Tedisco represents the 112th Assembly District. That's Schenectady in Saratoga counties. We thank you folks throughout the Capital District for joining us. And Jim Tedisco, always a pleasure to see you. It's always my pleasure. We have got, you know, a holdover of stuff we talked about in our last program. Things are still uh, percolating uh, quite busily here at the State Capitol in Albany. And uh, in our last program, I want to one of the things I want to carry on. We talked some about the implementation in the assembly chamber of uh, tablets on each assembly member's desk. This is something you've been working on for years and years. In fact, you had to push it through a couple different uh, separately elected uh, legislative sessions uh, in order to get it on the ballots or a constitutional amendment because. Uh, it's built right into the New York Constitution that bills need to sit on the members' desks for three days. And if we weren't going to have paper bills anymore, there had to be a change to the rules. Yeah, it's something we probably should have done 10 years ago if we could have, because it's going to make us, uh, it has already made us more efficient. It's going to save projected at a minimum $13 million a year. Imagine what we could do with that with school districts who are wanting for money, property tax reduction. But just as importantly, you know, we, the funny thing is we brought the tablets out this, this uh, year. We just brought them out a couple weeks ago on Earth Day. And uh, Mother Earth and Mother Nature is, I think, smiling right now because we're not putting those ink-filled reams of paper and tons of paper into landfills anymore. You know, and that's a good byproduct. We've got some footage. Let's just show it now of what it was like, uh, what it's been like well, uh, up until the last couple of weeks here in Albany. There's Jim Tedisco uh, legis or, uh, debating. Uh, this is a budget bill from a couple years ago. Yeah. I mean, this is, and I don't think, even think that's the entire budget right there. No, that's the, there's 12 budget bills. And when you add up all those 12 budget bills, hundreds and thousands of reams of paper, uh, tens of thousands of dollars in taxpayers' money just for those 12 budget bills. And uh, now everything you see there, and a tremendous amount more, in as you see, th those are the new tablets, and you see a, a minimal amount of paper on our desk uh, in those little, uh, those big black folders there. I don't know why they're there. That we won't need that, them anymore either, but there's an illustration of what it looks like, and uh, there I am. Uh, we were debating some bills on the floor, and I was uh, just uh, pulling up a few of these bills. It's but an easy thing to do, right? It's like an easy, anybody could do this. Even a state legislator can <laughs> can use one of these tablets. It's a no-brainer. And the good thing about this is you're not, go you know, I know Facebook is nice and uh, Twitter is good and uh, doing emails, but this is what the taxpayers voted for, 77% to go digital with the bills on our desk. And uh, this is what I'm, what I'm pulling up here. And look, uh, the important thing is you could pull it out Many times so far over the last couple of weeks we've had this tablet. Uh, I not only, not only pull it out on my desk, it's tethered, but I can stand up and I can read it and debate it. And there's a case where I'm uh, pulling up a portion of the bill and going right to it. Now before this, what I'd have to do, you'd have reams of paper on my desk. It would be flowing over to other people's desks. There would be paper and bills underneath the desk right. falling on the f floor. Look, our founding fathers, Mike, were very wise. They built a constitution similar to the United States Constitution, our state constitution. They tried to have a separation of judicial, executive, and legislative branches. But they did one thing that was extremely wise. They said, if you're a representative, to represent, you have to know what the bills are. Now, Nancy Pelosi, she may be a nice lady, but when she said you have to pass the bill before you can know what it does or read it or look at it, that was the stimulus bill. I think it was a thousand-page stimulus, a trillion dollars. The following year, we had 15% unemployment, so I don't know how well that, that uh, stimulus actually did. It was a lot of taxpayers' money with a lot of spending and deals made I inside of it. But our founding fathers realized, no, you've got to read the bill before you debate it and vote on it and either pass it up or pass it down, vote up or vote down. And I'll be truthful with you, if I can't read a bill, they don't give it to me in time because, you know, they've used eight messages of necessity. We talked about this before on these 12 budget bills. And when you're using a message as a necessity, it's supposed to be for an emergency. Well, what the emergency has been is to bring it out in the middle of the night, 
something that maybe the governor and the leaders aren't proud of, don't give you time to read it, guys are falling asleep, and you don't get a full airing. The media doesn't see it. And I've said this before. If they're serious about thinking it's good in the middle of the night to bring out a bill without being able to read it or debate it, why don't they have their press conferences in the middle of the night? No, nobody has their press conferences. The governor doesn't have his press conference in the middle of the night, 2 or 3 o'clock, when the media and the public isn't there. So we have to read the bills. They were wise to say it was in paper form. They, hundreds of years ago, they could never surmise we'd have the social media opportunities we have right now. And in that tablet there, we have everything we need. It's like almost, it is like night and day. When you, you just press that uh, spot, you, you can bring a 200, 300 page bill up. You can find the section you want. You can lift it up and read the section, debate it. You put it back in there. And, and the most important thing is it took five or six years of diligent work in marketing that bill. You, you know, I had to show them what was wrong with the process we were using right now with the technology we have. I had to tell them about, I had to weed out through Denny Farrell, who was the head of Ways and Means, how much we were losing in taxpayers' dollars, how much was going into landfills, uh, being destructive, a lot of ink, a lot of paper going into landfills, and how much more efficient we could be. And it took me a while, but I was like a dog on a pant leg, a dog <laughs> with a bone that wouldn't, wouldn't give it up. And uh, when they suggest that uh, you can't get something done, well, you can get something done here. And uh, I think I've accomplished a lot here. The property tax cap we first initiated, um, Buster's Law for animal felony cruelty, which is a bridge crime. People who hurt animals hurt people. Uh, we got that Used Resources Accountability Act, which the governor calls New York Store, so they're not throwing away computers and desks and chairs at the end of the year just so they can get their same amount of the budget back. We're putting that on eBay. We're selling it. We're saving taxpayers money. Fiscally responsible. So. Uh, I think this one thing, though, if I never do anything again, they, when they brought the tablets out, they said, we're bringing out Jimmy Tedisco's tablets. <laughs> and I was pretty proud of that. Yeah. And, and the Speaker Heasty said, the one thing I'm most happy about besides the efficiency that Tedisco keeps talking about is he, he won't keep yelling about the fact he can't see over the top of the bills <laughs> when he debates us. And uh, maybe I'm vertically challenged, five foot eight. And I, you know, I don't want to see over the top of the bills. I don't want all that paper all over my desk and I want to be able to find them. And we're debating better right now. We know the issues better right now. We're reading the bills right now. Because before, as I said, if I couldn't read a bill, I'd have to vote no on it because I wouldn't be responsible if I didn't know what it was in a bill, exactly what it was going to do uh, on behalf or for or against my constituents. If I voted for that, I wouldn't be a responsible public servant because we're representatives. And we're not there, Mike, as you know, to represent ourselves, our family. And as you see, we're having some problems with that now with some of our colleagues because they are representing themselves. We're there to represent the constituents uh, that we serve. We took an oath of office to do that. So. You know, people wonder why I came out with this uh, proposal a couple weeks ago, too, to stop the, the, the franking mail, sending that out mail. We get $40,000. Each member happens to get $40,000 a year to send out franking mail to communicate with their constituents, let them know what's going on. And I don't think that's a bad thing to communicate, but because uh, as a legislator, it's more important to be a good listener besides communicating and being a good speaker. But we've got the technology to uh, interact with our constituents. We, we can email them, we can uh, twit on, on Twitter, and uh, we've got Facebook, we've got all ways of interacting, and plus going in person in events, in, in the grocery store, in the market. So five years ago I said, no, I'm not sending out any mailings anymore. That's enough, I can communicate. I've got 5,000 friends, I've got other pages. Uh, I interact every day on, uh, on Twitter and on, on Facebook and in, in, in email. And uh, I don't think we have to spend $40,000, uh, a legislator, of taxpayers' dollars. And to be truthful, many times it's a, a lot of pictures, a lot of glossiness, almost like a campaign uh, presentation. Almost kind of, sort of, maybe, yeah. a little bit, right? Quite a bit, yeah. yeah. And I tried to do the best I could before we had uh, all the social media to tell them what was going on. But I like it better this way. So over the past five years, if you look at about $40,000, that's over $200,000 I've saved without the postage and the paper and mailing out. And then there's the printing costs. The printing costs, right. the delivery, and uh, of course the waste again. But uh, but I think uh, I do a great job communicating. I get great feedback from my constituents. In fact, uh, many of the ideas I've put forth which have been successful have come from my constituents and listening to them. And uh, of course you have to go sometimes make adjustments. You have to work with the, the counselors to see how you can make these pieces of legislation. But sometimes it's uh, eliminating 
uh, pieces of legislation that are not effective or efficient anymore. For Clearing the way, having the state of New York get out of our way. I've suggested we could take a couple weeks just to eliminate some laws we have here that aren't working too good for us. Well, the next challenge in front of you, uh, if, and again, this goes back to a conversation we had in our last program, it's an issue that's not going away anytime soon for the state legislature, is the common core issues. Right. You've been out there again talking about the uh, Parental Refusal Act, uh, and that seems to have been pretty effective because of what we've seen across the state is a lot of parents refusing to let their kids take part in that standardized testing. Opting out is the uh, is the phrase that's being used all the time, well, and you've had some success with that. Well, I think it's a real illustration that uh, as representatives, they're disappointed in the fact that uh, we haven't listened to them over the last two to three to four years, and they've given us due notice, you know, and they're, they've gotten to the point where civil disobedience is the only answer for them and they realize and that's why I put forth uh, the Common Core Parental Refusal Act to make sure they were protected if they said look you haven't listened we told you about the overutilization of these standardized tests which are not developmentally appropriate we talked about third and fourth and fifth graders doing comprehensive uh, essay questions in seventh eighth ninth tenth grade levels and when Mr. King our previous uh, Commissioner of Education says 70 percent of the kids are going to fail and then the governor says, well, that's okay, but we're going to use it as a 50% evaluator for the effectiveness of our teachers. Something's gone awry here. And I'm one of the few people who are educators here in the New York State Assembly and Senate. Ten years, of, I was taught special education, got my degree at the College of St. Rose, and I understand standardized tests. We need standardized tests as a portion of a whole bunch of measurements for evaluating, but not evaluating and stigmatizing kids or teachers, but helping to move them forward, finding out what their needs are, giving that information to the educator. The terrible part about this whole thing is they never let the educators see the test until the summer's over. So all, all that time after the test, they didn't have an opportunity to work with the kids on how they could move them forward. And here's something we have to understand. We're a diverse state right now. We have high need, low wealth districts. We have high wealth districts. And it's not a coincidence that in the high wealth low need districts, kids score better on tests and kids have better graduation rates. Why? It's a societal issue because in the high need districts there's a lot of poverty. There's not the level of parenting that there is happens to be in those high wealth districts. That's just a fact. And we're very discriminatory when we say, well there's going to be one way of learning, one way of testing, and every school has to follow that same way of testing. Even when a kid doesn't get to school because his parent isn't there to guide him, to discipline him uh, to the levels that they are in some of the other districts. So you, certainly you're not going to get the same evaluations and the same effectiveness and efficiency. I, I said let's do an experiment. Let's th take the highest scoring school in the state with the highest graduation rate and the lowest scoring school in the state with the lowest graduation rate and switch the teachers for five years. You know what? Unless you change the, the poverty levels and, and the parenting and the, and the job creation, you're going to get the same scores in the same test. You know. Now, don't get me wrong, a bad teacher should be removed. But if you have bad teachers, uh, let's say fair teachers, good teachers, and great teachers, we also need some mentoring programs and some training programs because you can turn, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, uh, maybe a fair teacher into a good teacher, a good teacher into a great teacher. But if you're not a, a good teacher and you've given the two or three years to be evaluated, then you have to be removed. I agree with that. But I don't agree with using a test where 70% of the kids are going to fail as an indicator of the effectiveness of that teacher. And I'll, I'll be truthful with you. Some kids are great at taking tests. They know everything. They've, they've crammed for it. They know the information. Then three weeks later, you could ask them. They forgot all the information. Some kids freeze up. Two or three weeks later, they could answer every question <laughs> that you had on that test if you talked to them verbally and they were in a calm setting. The real indictment was for the first time, and you know, I was a teacher for 10 years, took some tests, and I'm an adult, they actually sent home memos to parents on how to counsel their kids on the anxiety and stress of taking a test. Kids were vomiting, stabbing themselves with pencils. That tells me there's a problem with these testing levels. I sent a letter to Commissioner or Regents Leader Tish. We've sent a letter to the uh, uh, Congress, actually to the leaders in Congress and Senate and to the President saying don't penalize our schools if they decide we have to correct these testing processes. You, you know, but people understand it's a local issue. It's not a federal issue, education, or what's going on in the classrooms. The districts know themselves the best of anybody. Out of time, Jim Tedisco. Thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you, folks, too. We'll hope to see you soon for our next Assembly Calendar.